importance and why Japanese are slow to understand the gospel is a very good message. If you didn't get that message in your Japanese or if you're working in Japan, you really, really need to listen to this online. It's very, very good for you to understand what you're struggling against in trying to get Japanese to understand the gospel. And having been here with my wife, living here for uh, 17 years now, maybe longer. I don't even remember. Um, Hiroshi and I have come to an agreement. There are two things that we really, really need to make the Japanese understand. And it's, just, it's so much different than, you know, teaching a Westerner about the gospel. But one is, and Hiroshi mentioned it this morning, God understands you and he cares for you it's one but mostly that he, he understands you and the other un, without a doubt unequivocal is that a word thing you have to tell them is that God loves you that that's it I mean not convincing not saying well do you believe that do you accept that uh, no four spiritual laws none of that cut and dried stuff will will work. You'll just be frustrated to death trying to get the gospel out here. But please, I encourage you to listen to Pastor Hiroshi's message online. Okay? Amen. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today's service, Lord. You're so good to us. Lord, it was it's been so good worshiping you with brothers and sisters from all over the world with brothers and sisters with a heart and a desire to see Hiroshima one for you father change us today so that we will glorify your name in this city and these surrounding towns and mountains and valleys and villages and islands change our lives so that we will bring glory to your name Lord open our hearts to receive your word in Jesus precious name amen well today I'd like to continue with uh, my mini series on parables from Luke now in the West we tend to not call things as they are in the Bible in the Bible it says the wise and foolish builders and we are more polite and we call we call them that and I think the original language is a lot clearer it talks about the smart and stupid builders last week we talked about parables and in Luke and I'm going to continue that discussion today from Luke chapter 6 last week we talked from Luke chapter 5 about the calling of Levi and talking about fasting and uh, all those things and how Jesus made a point to talk about what true repentance means and it, we found out that the, the parable actually began with the call of Luke I have another title for this this section of scripture where I believe Jesus talks about a parable but here's the other title and it's a little more polite and a little more to the point of what Jesus is trying to get across are you a follower and a doer I don't know if doer is a word but it is today are you a follower and a doer there's another way you could title this section uh, let's just look at what we talked about last week and since I'm teaching from Luke let's review who Luke is he was a physician he wrote the gospel he was not a Jew he was the only non-Jew to write a gospel and about a physician in those days um, Luke was not regarded as the upper crust the the top the elite like physicians are today um, Luke was a very considered a very common person 
uh, in Jewish law and some Roman circles it was disgusting and unclean to touch a sick person so a phys physician had to do it. Luke also wrote the book of Lack, uh, Acts and uh, this is something I learned from Chris one time he said one time when he preached he said who wrote most of the Bible and I went Paul oh. and he said no Luke wrote most of the Bible volume wise uh, Paul wrote the most books but volume wise Luke is the humongous gospel and Acts is really huge and most of that is the that's the, the majority of the New Testament just those two books that's just the background of Luke so you'll know and then we talked a little bit about what a parable is and I went to Princeton Education online to find out and I thought wow these guys are smart so they should know basically a short moral story often with animal characters uh, anybody remember Jesus mentioning animal characters in his parables no he didn't Aesop did but not Jesus the tortoise and the hare was not a story from Jesus um, I, I like this definition from C.H. Dodd a guy who was around writing in the 30s 20s and 30s a Christian guy from England at its simplest the parable is a metaphor or simile drawn from nature or common life which I like the common life thing and I believe that's what Jesus did and it arrests it stops the hearer in his tracks by its vividness or strangeness and uh, strangeness meaning uniqueness here um, again just to review if you hear an illustration by me or Pastor Hiroshi or maybe even Chris uh, it might be strange but it still arrests you stop you in your tracks and make you think and leaves the mind in sufficient doubt and doubt meaning good doubts not bad sufficient doubt you're going I have to question this I have to look into it I have to think about this about its precise application to tease it into active thought to and tease is not bad here and I don't want to cheapen the parables of Jesus and say that he was just teasing people but he encouraged the mind to want more to think about this to, to be more active and that's a very good definition of what a parable is if you want it send me an email I'll send it to you I think it's really good and finally let's get to our text Luke chapter 6 verses 39 through 49 now you might look at your divisions in the NIV and say Kevin why aren't you starting with 37 and uh, these divisions here were not in the original text and sometimes you'll find that I disagree with the way the Bible is divided and I did that last week when I taught uh, thinking that we had to go with the call of Matthew all the way to the end of that section to understand the parable and here too I, I think we should have a different division so I'm going to start with verse 39 and read through 49 he also told them this parable can a blind man lead a blind man will they not both fall into a pit a student is not above his teacher but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye how can you say to your brother brother let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye you hypocrite first take the plank out of your eye then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye verse 43 no good tree bears bad fruit nor does a bad tree bear good fruit each tree is recognized by its own fruit people do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart for out of the overflow of his heart his mouth speaks verse 46 why do you call me Lord Lord and do not do what I say I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice he is like a man building a house who dug deep down in deep down uh, Chris thanks for the help this, in your testimony he's like a man who dug deep down and laid the foundation on rock when a flood came the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built but the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house 
on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Amen. Praise God for his word, huh? Oh, praise God for testimonies and how the Holy Spirit prepares the body to hear his word. Well, I think in this passage we can find seven critical questions that we need to ask. You're going to find again, as, as I teach these parables, and I'll do my best to give you a three or four point outline, but it doesn't always work. So I have some questions first that we need to look at, and we might get around to finding three points in there somewhere. But Jesus was telling these, this story to his disciples and to a crowd of people that was always hanging around and to the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees from last week, you might remember if you were here, were a group of religious teachers who always had hanging around them a group of scribes, people who knew the law very well. The Pharisees would follow the law very well. So we had the group of uh, biblical scholars, so to speak, who knew everything about the law and every point about the law and every rule everybody had to follow, and they would tell the Pharisees, and the Pharisees would do their best to follow that perfectly and also be the religious police at the same time, making sure everybody else followed those laws or they were outside of the religious acceptable circle. So Jesus had his own disciples following him around. He had some common everyday people following him around, going looking, all the, looking at all the miracles and, and trying to get in on some of the actions. Some of them were genuine followers. He had his disciples and he had these Pharisees and the, the scholars. So Jesus begins to ask these questions. Now scholars today wonder, is he talking to the Pharisees? Is he talking to uh, his own disciples? Is he talking to the commoners? You know what I think? I think he's talking to everybody. And I know that because I'm a parent. And a lot of times I would say things to my kids and they wouldn't hear. So for emphasis, I would come downstairs and I'd go, Midori, if those kids do that again, I'm going to bust their heads, I'm going to spank their, you know what? And, and I wasn't talking to Midori. I was, but I was talking, so my kids behaved and I wasn't even talking to them. I was addressing my wife, right? But I really wanted my kids to hear too. It was evident to everybody around them, including some of the neighbors of Midori saying, the neighbors are going to hear you. And my, my son caught on to that. So when I was spanking my son sometimes, he would go, somebody help me, my dad's killing me. So the neighbors would come running to rescue my son. It didn't always work, but I think this is what Jesus was doing. He was talking to them as a group. He might have been looking at Peter and John. He might have been looking directly at the Pharisees. But in his hearing, there were a lot of people, including us, because God has maintained this gospel for us to understand and to hear today. And here are some critical questions the group listening to Jesus needed to hear and that you and I need to hear and ask about today. All right. First one, am I sure that I can see? Question number one, am I sure that I can see? Jesus spoke a parable to them, and this one is a little bit of a outside the rule of a normal parable. It doesn't have a beginning and a middle and an end and kind of a conclusion like most of the other parables in Luke and in other Gospels, it's based on an old proverb. And Jesus uses it as a parable. And he says in verse 39, where are we here? All right. He told them this parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a, a pit? Now, I believe you and I are to be disciples and to disciple one another. We are to help one another to grow. We are, when we become a seasoned Christian, a mature Christian, to take someone in and teach them about the gospel, to disciple them, to tell them how to pray, when to pray, how to witness, when to worship. We, we can do that, and we can disciple people, and we are to do that. Yet, that doesn't give us a license to be 
like the Pharisees were, religious police. It means to make sure, first of all, that you can see, that you are where you are supposed to be with God. Now, who are these people following around Jesus? Well, his disciples were there, and they were getting pretty excited about what was going on in their lives. And I think Jesus is saying to his disciples, as well as to the Pharisees, as well as to the followers, okay, you, you're all telling everybody about me and about life and about this good news. Before you get too excited telling everybody else, make sure that you can see. If you're not ready yet, if you're not a disciple yet, how can you lead somebody when you can't even see yourself? Is basically what he was saying. I think he was saying to his disciples and to the Pharisees something very similar. I think he was encouraging his disciples to say, look, don't be like them. They think they know, but they really don't. And for you and I today, if you're a believer, yes, you have the spiritual eyes. You're in Christ. So you, you're, you can now, you were once blind, but now you see. But make sure that you're not just following Christ as an outsider, that you know where you are, that you've really made a commitment to Christ. And here's another one that we need to ask. Can I, can I lead others if I'm not really a follower? Can I lead others if I'm not really a follower? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be a teacher. Now, this is a very interesting verse, and how does it fit here, verse 40? I think we need to pay very careful attention to this one to be able to understand the rest. Okay? What is he saying here? A another translation is, apprentice doesn't lecture the master. The point is to be careful who you follow as your teacher. Now, in this case, Think of it like this. The disciple in those days of a rabbi, of a religious teacher, Jesus was a rabbi, really dedicated himself to that rabbi. He became so close to that rabbi that he began to talk like that rabbi, teach like that rabbi, walk like that rabbi, wear clothes like that rabbi. I mean, he was dedicated to be like that teacher. And that's the point Jesus is making. You're gonna, if you're going to follow a certain teacher, you're going to be like that teacher. You're not going to be above the teacher. You're not going to teach the teacher. You're going to follow the teacher and become like him. And then your disciples are going to be baby missionaries. Okay? Missionaries make, you know, small missionaries. And they are like that master missionary. So if Chris takes a disciple on, and he begins to teach him and, and everything that he's learned at Biola and all his experiences here in Japan, in a lot of ways, that disciple is going to be like Chris. And that's what Jesus is saying. A disciple is like his teacher. So be careful who you follow. Now, the Pharisees had not just themselves out there, but they had their little followers all over the place. So Jesus is making a wide proclamation saying to the followers of these Pharisees, be careful who you follow. You're going to be like these guys. No, I mean, that's just the way it is. That's the parable. You're going to be like the people you decide to follow. If, if you decide to follow a certain rabbi and he does good things, you're going to do good things. If the rabbi lacks a proper view of life, what are his disciples going to, what kind of view of life are they going to have? the student will also be misled. And that's what Jesus is saying in verse 40, I think. Okay, here's another question. What is in my eye? I think Jesus is telling a joke here in a way. Right? He's saying, look, you're so critical. Okay, you've moved a step ahead. Right? 
you know where you are, you know who you're following, and here you are looking at somebody else and saying, hey, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. Imagine saying this to the Pharisees, if that's who he's talking to, you know, the Pharisees, he's saying the Pharisees are somewhat righteous, but I think he's, he's talking, it's a broader picture. And he's saying, okay, you can see, but can you see clearly? What is that thing in your eye that's keeping you from seeing? And he says, this is what he says. Let me read the scripture again. Verses 42, 41 and 42. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no, no attention to the plank in your eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fa fail to see the plank in your own eye, you hypocrite? First take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly, okay, you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, you know what a sawdust is. You've, everybody's cut a, a piece of wood and you've seen a little speck of dust fly from the wood you've cut. It's the tiniest piece compared to a plank, a large piece of wood. Now, this could be the, a symbol. You know, in those days they followed all the traditions and all that. And what Jesus is saying is, you look at the slightest failure to follow the law. You look at that and make a big deal out of such a small infringement of the law that you don't wash your hands before you eat. Uh, you don't sit down the proper way when you teach. You look at those things, but in your own eye, you have this big plank. You have the truth of God available to you, but you're not seeing around because of all the laws and traditions you've put there, you're not seeing the mercy of God. You're not seeing the love of God. You're not seeing what God intended for the Messiah to be because you've got this plank of tradition in front of your own eyes. And when some, somebody needs some truth, you, you see a little tiny thing in your eye and you, you forget all the mercy and love of God. You're so busy with minor infractions of the rules that you've forgotten the, the large consequences of not finding Christ. And you and I can do that as a Christian. We might see somebody who comes to church dressing just bizarre. And I've been guilty of it myself. And I'm going, man, is that a girl or a guy? I don't know. Can you get saved? <laughs> yeah. And I, I've taught that. I'm going, who cares? He needs Jesus the smallest infraction, how he's dressed, can hinder me from looking at the big need, the big picture. God loves him. Jesus died for him. The Holy Spirit drew him in here. And what are you looking at that speck for instead of looking at the big picture eternity, eternal life? Kevin, get that speck out of your eye. Get, I'm sorry, get that plank out of your eye before you look at the speck in somebody else's eye. And Jesus is saying that to us today as well as to the group he was teaching to. Verses 43 and 44. Now, I like the way Jesus does this. Jesus has this crowd in his hands. I really, really believe this. And how does he do that? Well, He's probably, well, there's no doubt that Israel at the time depended a lot on their own agricultural skills. And they grew grapes, and they grew figs, and wheat, and barley, and a lot of other things. And Jesus uses all of these in his parables. In this case, he's talking very basic agricultural skills and the crowd who is listening to him knows about these things and he says for a good tree doesn't bear bad fruit nor does a bad tree bear good fruit now what he's saying here in good fruit I mean bad fruit he's talking about the wrong kind of fruit you wouldn't get an uh, an apple 
off of a banana tree. You get a banana off of an apple tree. No. <laughs> right? You get an apple off of an apple tree. Not, not the other way around. And that's what Jesus is saying. Every tree is known by its fruit. You know what kind of fruit that tree is going to produce. It's not unusual, right? And the crowd goes, yeah, that's right. Men don't gather figs from thorn bushes. And in Israel, they have these thorn bushes that are, their thorns are huge. They're this big and, and they're just nothing. They produce no leaves, no nothing of value except the thorns themselves. And so he's saying, that doesn't produce anything good. It's just a thorn bush. And I think he's continuing the thought by saying this from verse 40. Like teacher, like student. Right? The rabbi taught the student. And you're going to be like the rabbi. You, you decide to follow that guy, you're going to be like him. So be careful who you follow. But if he's a good guy, follow him diligently. Follow him thoroughly. In verse 40, and here we learn like tree, like fruit. It's not very difficult. Everybody's going, yeah, this is good. I said, we, we agree with that, Jesus. The idea is consistent between product, fruit, and source, tree. Disciple? Disciple is the fruit. The source is the master. So we see this con continuation. Nature of the tree tells us what kind of fruit we can expect from it. Jesus said that a bad tree brings forth bad fruit because the tree is bad. A thorn bush can't produce grapes or figs. It won't happen. You wait 100 years, 200 years, 10,000 years, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I think when Jesus taught Nicodemus in John chapter 3, this was true. He said, you got, you got to be born again. I mean, to bring forth good fruit is not because a person's character changes. It's because it's been reborn. I mean, the person's been reborn and the, the, the nature has been changed. And that's the only way good fruit can, can happen. That's a whole different sermon. And uh, I'm getting off track, but let's get excited. Question number five. Does what come out, comes out of my mouth match my treasure? That is, what is in my heart. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Look, and, and please get this, just as the fruit of a tree is is a clear indication of the nature of the tree, I, I think our, our actions, our words, and what we do, our attitudes as well, are an unfailing indication. Here, that's the word. An unfailing indication of the state of our heart. Okay, let me say that one more time. Our actions, our words, our attitudes, and what we do are a very clear indication of the state of my heart. All right? And that's what Jesus said. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings out good. Like tree, like fruit. Like master, like disciple. I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to match. And what, what is in my heart is going to come out. Let me ask you to ask, this is a sub-question, if someone were to evaluate your faith on the basis of the tone and character of your daily speech and actions and attitudes, what conclusion would they draw? What would they say about you and about your faith and about your Christianity? And I think this is something that we have to ask ourselves was what coming out of me indicative of who's on the throne of my life? Is that happening? I mean, it is happening, but is it 
is it good? Is it where God wants us to be? If someone were to evaluate our faith on what I say and do and my attitudes, what would they conclude about my faith? Is there a way to verify my discipleship? And I think Jesus clarifies it for us in verses 46 through 49, which I'm going to read again. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Now, before I read, let me set it up, right? Jesus has these people surrounding him, and he's talking about disciples and teachers, and then he's talking about trees, you know, and, you know, fig trees, figs, thorn bushes, thorns, you know, fruit, fruit, and it's people going, yeah, we know agriculture. Tell us about it, Jesus. Yeah. Right? And he's got them. It's almost like Jesus baited the trap. I don't know. Does that cheapen it? But I don't know. I think he was saying, he was teasing them a bit, using a little humor too, and he got the crowd going, hey, let me tell you a joke. You got a speck in your eye. You talk about that guy with a speck in his eye. You got a, wood, a tree in your eye. You know, and everybody's like, <laughs> and then he goes, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not say what I do, do not do what I say. I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not do them, but does not put them into practice, is like a man who built his house on, a gr on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Well, there's only two places in the whole book of Luke where somebody calls Jesus Lord, but obviously there was, this was happening. All these people hanging around Jesus, going, Lord, uh, we're for you, Jesus. And the disciples, too, some of them not behaving as Jesus wanted him to. And here we are today, and we read the gospel, and we're going, Lord, we love you. We sing it, and we're not doing what we should be doing as Christians. And Jesus said, okay, you call me Lord, you sing me Lord. You know, and my favorite illustration, I surrender all, I surrender all, and we really mean I surrender some, not all. And Jesus says, well, why do you call me that? You're not doing what I tell you to do. People who called him Lord surrounded him on every side. But just to call Jesus Lord is not the test of being a disciple, is it? As a matter of fact, Jesus warns of, of that in the Gospels. I think Jesus was really laying it on those around him and his own disciples. And for certain, the Pharisees were really getting upset by this discussion. And I think the real test of discipleship is not in what we say, but in what? What we do, of course. What we do. And... This is such a great story about the building. And he tells this story. And he says, listen, listen, listen to this very carefully. Let's read it again. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Verse 47, look. I will show you what he is like who comes to me. Right? Look at the text. Who comes to me. Hmm? And hears my words and puts them into practice. There you, there you go, your three-point sermon. But Jesus summarizing it for you. Okay. Number seven. Number seven, question number seven. Is my building secure? Let's see how Jesus summarizes it. We'll skip that one. Come to me. Hear my word do it. This is what this whole parable is about. And Jesus summarizes it in this story of the two builders. Because look, look at the next one. Look at the next one. But the one who hears my words, that's it. But the one who hears my words and doesn't do them, he hasn't come to Jesus 
and he's certainly not doing it. He's just hearing the words. He's just out there, and he's a hearer. Yeah, I like that. It's cool. This is fun. <laughs> I was on a. I went to a revival uh, meeting in Tokyo, and I was getting on a bus because we went to the parking lot, and you had to take a bus to the hotel to get there. And as I was getting on the bus, I was just shocked by these people from another, not from Japan, and not living in Japan. They come from another country, and they're saying, "Yeah, we like the the newness movement." And we follow it all over the place. And they're going, well, you know, I'm not really a believer yet, but I, I love the way these guys sing and stuff. And they were just running around the world following this revival kind of thing. They were hearing only. And they'd go and hear these great speakers and listen to the good music. And they hadn't even made a commitment to Christ yet. Amazing. But the, the person who doesn't do, that builds foolishly, the stupid builder, the one who hears my words and doesn't put them into practice is the guy who builds without boring into the bedrock. Amazing, huh? Jesus is saying everyone who comes and hears and does his words is a disciple who can endure the assailing floods of adversity. Coming to Christ, hearing his word, And not doing it is just foolish, foolish, foolish. I have a bunch of more notes, but we're just going to go right through them. Here's the stupid builder. Here's what the stupid builder does. He just hangs out. I, I know there's a point when, you know, I mean, I know Christ come, calls us. And he draws us. And he does the saving. But if you've been hanging around Christians for any amount of time and you're still undecided, there's a reason why you're hanging around them. Because God is drawing on your heart. The reason you're hearing the Word of God, the reason you're in church today is because the Holy Spirit's pulling you. God cares about you. He loves you and He's drawing on your heart. And I think that the fall of the house is tragic, Jesus says in verse 49. And I think it's tragic because it happens again and again and again and again. It never stops. The person without Christ goes from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. More education, a new car, a new girl, a new whatever. And you're not satisfied. Never going to be satisfied. You just keep building on the surface. you got to build bore down into the bedrock. Koichi. I'm going to conclude. Forget the rest of my notes. We're going to turn it up. Follow along. You don't have to. You can't.
your foundation the solid rock are you the smart carpenter are you the stupid carpenter let's pray Heavenly Father Lord continue to teach us your word let us not read it lightly. Let us not clip out a verse here and there. But let us look at all that you're teaching us. And let it take root in our hearts. Lord, let us make absolutely clear that the lessons here today are lessons that we will hold deep in our heart as coming directly from you. Lord, I pray that every one of us, Lord, is, has our foundation as the solid rock, Jesus Christ. Father, if there's one here who has never committed his life to Christ, I pray that this day they will take their stand on Jesus the solid rock and realize that everything else is just sand Lord let the person make that commitment to you today and Lord for the rest of us to do an evaluation today not of our salvation Lord but maybe of our arrogance maybe to make sure that we don't have trees in our eyes before we're critical of others to make sure that our character 
the words we speak and the actions that we do come from the treasure that you've put in our heart and not on junk. Let our lives again, once again, if we're a believer here and we've turned away, let our lives once again reflect you, Jesus, on the throne. Then we will truly do and say and have an attitude of Jesus and not one of selfish me. Father, change our lives today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you. Yeah. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We have fellowship.